Ladies and gentlemen, um, good afternoon and welcome to the Geneva Center for Security Policy. Today we're launching a new event series called Security and Law, a Reality Check. And so the goal is to address how international law matters in security affairs. Concretely, to assess if current norms still fit contemporary and future security challenges, how international commitments can effectively be implemented, and how new international law can be successfully shaped. And we launched this series, the Reality Check series, with a topical discussion, the Trump administration and international law. And we do this today with a very, very special guest, Professor Harold Coe. Now, Professor Coe is one of the persons that we do not need to introduce because you know him and his work. Yet it would be quite impolite to not introduce him. On the other hand, also, if I read down the list of all his major achievements, uh, we're going to spend the whole day and the whole night just reading out that list. So I will stick to a short version that he termed as four live streams. 35 years as a law professor, currently as Sterling Professor of International Law at Yale Law School, nearly 30 years as human rights lawyers, five years as Dean of Yale Law School, and 10 years in the United States government, serving as Reagan Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, then in the Clinton and Obama administration, State Department, first as Madeleine Albright's Assistant Secretary for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, later as Hillary Clinton's legal advisor. But now, let's not look into the past, look at the future, and also especially look at the present. <coughs> Professor Hal Coe is here today with us at GCSP. Professor, it's an honor and privilege. I give you the floor. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Tobias. It's great to be here with uh, many friends uh, in this uh, beautiful and impressive uh, surrounding. Um, as uh, Tobias mentioned, uh, I have spent my life in these four <laughs> life streams. Please do not add these up. Some of these uh, sentences ran concurrently, but I made many memorable trips to Geneva. Uh, this is probably the most famous picture of me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we were uh, going to uh, Libya, Tri Tripoli, after the fall of Gaddafi, and um, uh, we were on a military transport, so they put some nicer seats so that we could sit there, and then all these people began to take pictures of us. It was a little embarrassing, so I texted to Hillary Clinton, look over your shoulder, and that's actually what she's uh, reading, <laughs> not uh, who run the world, girls, or whatever, although the world might be better if this were the case. Um, we have, uh, since then, as you know, uh, faced a different kind of administration. Um, I obviously did not vote for that administration, but I did not seek for them to fail. Uh, but in a very short period of time, this administration has created an almost uh, unprecedented set of disruptions of international law that could permanently change the nature of our relationship with international law institutions and our allies. Uh, including many who are here in Geneva. So the question is, is there a counter strategy that can be employed um, to respond uh, to the Trump administration's approach that preserves respect for the rule of law? Um, I have a book coming out on this at Oxford University Press. Uh, it'll be out in the fall. It's called The Trump Administration in International Law. Uh, please buy it in, in the hardcover version. <laughs> but I thought uh, I would give you a little bit of a preview of uh, the analysis. Uh, my counter strategy is also my academic theory, uh, which I have been uh, presenting in a series of academic articles going back almost a quarter of a century, which is called a transnational legal process. And what I want to argue is that the main way to um, <coughs> Uh, enforce international law is to internalize it into domestic systems. That when international law is brought home and made a part of uh, a, a domestic law, it is obeyed uh, and it becomes sticky. 
and it creates default patterns of law observance that it's hard for someone to break who's come from the outside. Now, if this is true, there are many players in the transnational legal process. There are uh, subnational entities in the United States, the states and localities, or the cantons here in Switzerland. There's bureaucracy, both domestic and international. There's the media. There's non-governmental organizations. There are intergovernmental organizations of the kind of whom you have many, many um, here in Geneva, and committed individuals. And the theory is that they should provoke interactions, uh, for example, lawsuits, that lead to interpretations, namely rules of law, that lead to the internalization of global norms into uh, domestic law. This will promote <coughs> internalization and this will promote stickiness. And the argument is that it is very hard for Donald Trump to undo this stickiness. If there's a basic message I want to convey is, for all you read, for all the fire and fury, uh, not that much is really changing. Not doesn't mean we're not under attack, but it means that there is a counter strategy, which is deploy the tools that are available. Now, this is very, uh, sounds very um, uh, academic. Uh, the layperson's term is, uh, we play rope-a-dope, like uh, Muhammad Ali. In one of the f most famous prize fights of all time, Muhammad Ali was in Zaire facing a much stronger, uh, bigger, younger opponent, George Foreman. And in the first round, he just simply retreated to the ropes and let Foreman pound him. And I, I remember listening to this uh, fight on the, the radio. We thought he would be killed. Um, but somehow, it turned out that he was taunting his opponent and absorbing these blows, which were largely ineffectual. By round eight, George Foreman had punched himself out. He was exhausted, at which point um, Ali came off the ropes and, and uh, won the fight. The same notion here is let Trump expend his energy by uh, devoting his uh, energy and capital to a variety of initiatives that don't advance his or his party's chance for re-election, burn up his political capital until he loses his electoral majority. And just yesterday is another example. We're still waiting for the outcome, but a, a district that he won by over 20% um, is now right on the margin. Now, <coughs> this is both an inside strategy and an outside strategy for the enforcement of international law. And this is part of a broader uh, set of works that I'm uh, working on in, uh, for, a book for another book for Oxford Press. That from the outside, we use the strategy of interact, interpret, and internalize. From the inside, we use an approach that I call international law as smart power, engage, translate, and leverage. Uh, another term for this is alliance politics. This is what we have employed uh, collectively, the law-abiding democratic nations of the world, to try to achieve multilateral outcomes. And you see that these <laughs> strategies um, are, are actually complementary. Interaction is engagement. Interpretation is translating uh, new rules to uh, emerging situations. For example, the Geneva Conventions to drones or to uh, cyberspace. <laughs> Leverage is to try to use a legal position as the basis for a broader um, diplomatic solution. And what I want to argue is that these two approaches have become the main counter strategy for effective resistance. Now, <clears throat> uh, where did this come from? Um, it was articulated most specifically by President Obama and Secretary Clinton. It would have been Hillary Clinton's approach if she were president. Uh, I show this picture mainly to show you how young Obama used to look. <laughs> He said at his inauguration, uh, a new era of engagement has begun. Respecting the law, living our values doesn't make us weaker. It makes us safer and stronger. Hillary Clinton uh, articulated as Secretary of State the idea of smart power using a broad range of tools, not just hard power, but diplomacy, development, respect for law, human rights, public-private partnerships, and to try to leverage them into longer-term diplomatic solutions. And Obama, in his State of the Union message in 2015, said, this is the kind of 
smarter kind of leadership that he's hoping to achieve, <coughs> um, combining military power with diplomacy, leveraging power with coalition building. Now, why do I mention this? Because the Trump doctrine is the opposite. Uh, not engage, but disengage. Uh, not multilateralism, but unilateralism. Uh, So-called America first. Uh, little mention of law. Little effort to translate uh, uh, from national values to uh, international law rules. If anything, they argue that there is no law to be applied. And little or no effort to get a diplomatic engagement strategy. At times, Trump will turn to diplomacy, supposedly now turning to diplomacy with North Korea. He has no diplomats to do it. He has no strategy. Um, and it's a, a dramatic 180 degree turnabout. And little is said by Trump to suggest that he has any respect for the rule of law. So <coughs> uh, what do we see? It's, it's a little extreme to say that Trump expresses a strategy. What we see is a series of, of impulses. Uh, those impulses are uh, he desires to reverse Obama and what Hillary Clinton would have done. His uh, posture is uh, uh, isolationist. Um, to the extent possible, he tries to withdraw from global leadership or to inter undermine international institutes institutions as a matter of national law. He seeks extreme deference for his presidential power. Uh, his assistants say uh, he will not be questioned. Um, the means to these ends is to denigrate facts and science, uh, to di diminish diplomacy as a tool of law. He achieved this successfully by the appointment of uh, Rex Tillerson, who um, farewell to him, but he basically <coughs> gutted the State Department and then got fired <coughs> by tweet, um, losing most of the career bureaucracy. Then if challenged, he calls it fake news. And demanding, again, deference from those who would challenge him, Congress, the courts, our allies, international organizations, media, and the NGOs. And then perhaps the most um, ignored strategy of Trump is to flood the zone with daily initiatives. Um, so many things happen, you forget the last thing. Uh, for example, um, it may well be that the initiative around North Korea was a dis <laughs> distraction from the other news of the day, uh, which was the claim that uh, some of his campaign people had met with Julian Assange. That's a story that is not getting much attention now because of uh, the story he got out there instead. So let me illustrate this very quickly across a range of areas. Immigration, human rights, climate, Iran, North Korea, cyber conflict and Russian hacking, Ukraine and uh, ISIS and Syria. This is a lot and I'll move through it quickly. You may not agree with the analysis in any particular area, but the point that I want to stress is that you are seeing this counter strategy playing out across the board <coughs> in each area and it is largely working. So let's take Trump's immigration policy. One of the core of his platform is hostility to immigrants and scapegoating of immigrants. The, the travel ban, one, two, and three. Attack on sanctuary cities, who would give special refuge to these immigrants. Uh, his claim that he wants to build a wall paid for by Mexico, although the, the Mexico paying for it part seems to have dropped out, along with it very strict border control. The main strategy seems to be self-deportation, shock and awe, to scare people so they leave. To end the uh, dreamers, who are those who were uh, brought here as children, have lived nowhere else, uh, through this DACA-DAPA discussion. Uh, some of the Republicans have introduced something called the skills-based immigration bill. Um, he's shown uh, hostility to refugees who, as you know from uh, UNHCR, is actually a protected uh, privileged individual under international law. Under Trump's analysis, they are all terrorists. Um, so it's a remarkable turnaround to treat the favorite of international law as the ultimate enemy. Hostility to the courts, who he calls so-called judges. And then an amazing fact, which is that Trump is willing to bomb for Syrian children who he will not admit into the United States. So that's uh, <coughs> all of this has emerged over time. 
what has been the response? Well, the spart response starts in the streets. Uh, here is uh, my daughter, um, who is, uh, uh, works for the city of New York. Uh, she and my wife, who is a, a, a legal services attorney, and I went to Washington uh, the day after the inauguration. And on that day, there were marches in dozens of cities worldwide, but in the United States, several million in New York, half a million in DC, they were chanting, this is what democracy looks like. And then came executive orders. So the travel ban one um, listed a number of countries, majority Muslim, and said that the people could not come to the United States on visas or as refugees. Uh, the immediate response was, this is bad law. It is a, a, a violation of rules against religious discrimination. It's also bad politics. Uh, notice that Trump had called for a system of extreme vetting. Uh, what he didn't appreciate is, is that's what we have. We have a system of extreme vetting. It's a system of extreme individualized vetting. Uh, in the United States, Maybe Trump doesn't believe it, but everybody else believes that you judge individuals according to the content of their character, not by where they're from or what God they worship or the color of their skin. And as a result, <coughs> um, we do not rely on country bans uh, as a way to protect us against counter-terrorist threats. It turns out that uh, a travel ban based on countries is wildly over-inclusive and under-inclusive. And it was a policy that was not seen by any senior official, including the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of, uh, of State, or the Secretary of Homeland Security. And they never evaluated the economic cost, which in the first year has been calculated to be $1.8 billion lost revenue. So what happened? <coughs> um, uh, I organized a group of my uh, former colleagues. Um, Secretary Albright, Secretary Kerry, uh, former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta, former Secretary of Homeland Security Janet Napolitano, four former heads or deputy heads of the CIA, who both Republicans and Democrats, the National Security Advisor Susan Rice, and both of her de deputies Lisa Monaco and Avril Haines. And we filed a declaration in court urging an interpretation, this interact, interpret, internalize in which we said that the travel ban was not just bad law or bad human rights, it, it was bad national security policy. And we said that a number of these individuals were on the classified information stream on January 20th. Nothing changed between January 20th and January 27th. That meant that this was a measure looking for a threat, not a threat that required a measure. As a result, <clears throat> the State Department then responded. There's something called the dissent channel, which is a way to object to government policy. A thousand career officials immediately said, we are better than this. This ban is counterproductive. It turned out that uh, Trump had not checked with the Justice Department as to whether they would defend the legality of his order. Uh, the acting attorney general, Sally Yates, refused to do so, and then she resigned. Um, at that point, uh, my students uh, filed a lawsuit on behalf of an Iraqi interpreter who was being stopped at Gen John F. Kennedy Airport. They filed a habeas class action, and what they did was they uploaded to the internet templates for filing individualized habeas corpus petitions for anyone who was stopped at an airport. Lawyers then rushed to the airports uh, more than uh, 40,000 over the first weekend they downloaded these templates and started filing these habeas petitions. The Uber drivers and taxi drivers who drove them to the airports joined and suddenly the uh, demonstrations had shifted from street marches uh, in the mall to uh, airports where uh, class actions were being filed, orders were being issued. People were showing the orders of the judges to the immigration officials on their cell phones, this forced revival, rev revision of the orders, et cetera. Meanwhile, <coughs> other allies, other players in this process, what you're seeing here is what I call transnational legal process in action, were coming into the fray. Uh, the uh, leader of the Iraqi military said, I'm a four-star general. I spent most of the last few years fighting alongside the United States. I can't come in. As a result, Iraq was removed from the list. 
tech companies, 163 filed a brief in support of the opposition to the ban. Uh, traditional Republicans, and these are not, uh, these are people like Dick Cheney, John Yoo, uh, the Koch brothers. Well, let me repeat that. Dick Cheney, John Yoo, the Koch brothers said, this is too much for us. I mean, this is really a first. Countless acts of solidarity. And then, <clears throat> although the president purported to be operating within the zone of his greatest power, uh, nearly 30 court orders were issued over the next period, all of them blocking the order, one by the so-called judge, uh, Judge Robart. So Trump's order was blocked everywhere. What he did, he withdrew it. Meanwhile, other uh, allies were coming into play, Angela Merkel, Justin Trudeau. Uh, at the G20 summit, Trump was isolated. Members of Congress, uh, Republicans, broke away from him and criticized the executive order. States and localities, 15 of them, said they would not enforce travel detainers issued by the Depart Department of Homeland Security. A federal challenge was brought to the Sanctuary Cities order and it was struck down also as illegal. Universities said that they would give sanctuary to their students, 47 of them, including my own University of Yale, which I'm very proud to say. Uh, the agencies would suddenly begin, uh, we found leaking of documents. So for example, Homeland Security leaked a document, uh, internal document, which said that travel bans, country bans don't work. Somehow this had never been mentioned uh, in popular culture. Um, the Museum of Modern Art exhibited, uh, excluded individuals' art. Uh, Super Bowl commercials, our, our greatest athletic event, suddenly depicted all of these immigrants setting up beer companies in the United States, Saturday Night Live. Uh, the media and social uh, media uh, illustrating the human impact. And marches on all sets of issues, climate, science, uh, a day without immigrants where you couldn't get a meal in New York, uh, a day without women where essentially nothing occurred anywhere. <coughs> By this point, our brief had gathered 49 uh, signatures and we filed <coughs> against the second travel ban. Um, our basic argument is the famous Bill Clinton argument, which is you can put more lipstick on that pig, but it's still a pig, right? <laughs> you can call it something other than a Muslim ban, but it's still a Muslim ban. And we pointed out that <coughs> the national security justification uh, just went the other way. It was harming our troops in the field. It was ha harming our counterterrorism efforts. It was harming domestic law enforcement because Muslim American groups who had previously been cooperating and identifying people who had been radicalized stopped doing so. And it was offensive to our humanitarian values. And we argued that the so-called deliberation that went into the second travel ban was simply an outcome-driven effort to replicate the first ban in slightly more cosmetic terms. Again, block, block, block. And they withdrew it again. And then travel ban 3.0. And again, blocked and blocked. So the travel ban has now been blocked almost 40 times. No court has ruled against it. The Supreme Court has agreed to hear the case and it will be heard on April 25th. Um, now, <coughs> we have a very conservative Supreme Court Along the way, uh, by the blocking of Merrick Garland and the appointment of uh, Neil Gorsuch, Trump picked up a vote. In some of the early going, uh, the Chief Justice Roberts and Kennedy have taken a middle position. Uh, there's a whole range of issues that arise. Uh, we're working on our brief now. But we don't know what's going to be the outcome here. But the point which is larger is how much does Trump really care about this? He thought it was going to be easy. It's driven a wedge between him and uh, many of his supporters. Uh, every bit of time he spends on this takes away from his core issues, which are economic. Um, his other efforts, like repealing Obamacare, have failed. It may well be that, particularly if the Supreme Court rules against him, Trump will try to figure out a way to check a box, declare victory, and move on. This is transnational legal process at work. Now, just a point of clarification, uh, some people say to me, oh, you, you mix politics, policy, international law, and domestic law. And the answer is yes, of course. They all work together in unexpected ways. Sometimes things that are legal are 
bad policy, what we used to call lawful but awful. Sometimes things which are good law and policy are not politically available because you can't get the votes. And sometimes things that are um, good policy or interesting policy can't be implemented as a matter of law. But the fact of the matter is all of these different kinds of constraints are being brought to bear. We were part of a web of relations, and Trump tried to disrupt it unilaterally, and it's not that easy. Now, if that's the message in the area of immigration, let me illustrate it more quickly in a number of other areas. Here is our ex-Secretary of State. Um, famously, at his confirmation hearing, when asked about human rights, he said, I'm not ready to judge. You know, he wasn't ready to judge Duterte. Um, he never engaged uh, on these issues with China, Russia, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, or the Philippines. Uh, particularly troubling was his softness on human rights issues in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Bahrain, uh, Turkey, congratulating Erdogan on an irregular referendum. Uh, the Turkish government beat up demonstrators outside the U.S. Embassy in Washington. They said nothing. And <coughs> the um, uh, proposal was put forward to eliminate the words democracy and human rights from the State Department <coughs> mission statement. Now, I was the head of the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, so I don't know if that bureau would continue to exist or just be called the Bureau of Labor. But <coughs> um, um, I do not regret the, the firing of uh, Tillerson. I think it shows you what it takes to be the head of Exxon, not as much as you think. Um, he was an inept Secretary of State, and he did enough damage to the department. I don't have high hopes for his successor, but at this point, I think many were ready for him to move on. Now, Trump had said during the election, um, torture works. He says, I want to return to waterboarding, and a hell of a lot worse than waterboarding. Uh, there was discussion of restoring black sites and enhanced interrogation tactics. Um, in fact, a leaked draft executive order proposed that idea. Uh, but the problem is, uh, these are not policies, they are laws. We have a series of treaties that have internalized these norms. We have a series of statutes that make it illegal to return to torture. Um, common Article 3, uh, which you all know very well, says that you cannot use torture uh, under any circumstance. <coughs> I was asked at a congressional testimony when I was first starting out as legal advisor, they said, Professor, which, by the way, is not a term of respect in Washington. <laughs> said, last time I checked, uh, the terrorists hadn't signed the Geneva Conventions. And I said, well, Senator, last time I checked, the whales haven't signed the whaling convention either. <laughs> um, I'm just a country lawyer, but um, the fact of the matter, this is not a matter of contract. It is a matter of a minimum humane standard of treatment. <laughs> and. Um, by the time the Obama administration ended, they said unambiguously, these are categorically prohibited under domestic and international law. These exist everywhere and at all times, said Obama. Uh, about <coughs> a month before he left office, we prohibited torture everywhere. That includes tactics like waterboarding. Now, why does it matter? Because the following individuals have all said they will not implement a torture order. This norm has been internalized. General Mattis, Secretary of Defense, General McMaster, National Security Advisor, General Kelly, Chief of Staff, the new designated head of the uh, State Department, Mike Pompeo, even Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General, has said at his congressional testimony that he will not give a torture order. Now, as of yesterday, the nominee to be the head of the CIA, Gina Haspel, was known for having participated in one of the black sites. But she hasn't been confirmed. And what you can expect is that they will extract from her a concession at her confirmation, if, if she does get confirmed, that she will not implement a torture order. And as a result, through this process of internalization, <coughs> torture is still prohibited in the United States. Now, people are worried. You have reason to be worried. Um, it's not a reason to be complacent, but uh, the counter strategy is also working here. What about climate change? 
Here we have the famous transition from the Kyoto process, which was a highly prescriptive top-down legal process with differentiated emissions targets for developed and developing nations, to the framework set up starting in 2009 at Copenhagen, a much more uh, informal, non-prescriptive, bottom-up architecture, largely political with greater symmetry. It led to um, the adoption in November of 2016 of the Paris Climate Agreement by 196 countries. Uh, it was a classic example of engage, translate, and leverage. Engage with other countries, translate a new norm, leverage into a double trigger of uh, large emitters and um, uh, countries who are members of the framework convention. And here's the catch. It entered into force four days before the election that brought in Donald Trump, and he can't withdraw for four years. That's the day after the next election. Now, <laughs> he said on June 1st of last year, I'm going to withdraw. And um, he tweeted, I'm going to withdraw. And he's done a bunch of things about this. Um, and I went to an event where a well-known <laughs> French diplomat said, the United States is in a state of virtual suspension of its commitments. To which I said, the United States is still a party to the Paris Climate Agreement. And you're a diplomat in Paris, and you don't know that. Nothing has changed. As a matter of law, he issued a tweet. Tweets are not executive orders. As they say in Casablanca, we'll always have Paris. <laughs> Trump doesn't own climate change. He is one player. Even his own members of his own family disagree with his perspective. Now, some, you know, uh, Gary Cohn have just departed. Who knows? But look what could happen in the meantime. We can't announce the withdrawal before November of 2019. Uh, the constitutional aspects would be litigated, as in the Brexit uh, withdrawal. If they litigate starting in November 2019, the litigation could easily extend past the election. Uh, Scott Pruitt here wants to announce the withdrawal of the implementing legislation, the, clean the regulation of the Clean Power Plan. Uh, that's being litigated and will be litigated for years. Many members of big business favor staying in Paris. And remember, the United States was in arrears of its UN dues for many years, but then came back into compliance. The default is not leaving. It's staying in and underperforming. That may not be the optimum situation, but it's curable. So the default of all of what Trump has done is what I call resigning without leaving. After all, Trump has and his people have indicated that the United States will continue to attend the cops of the Paris climate deal, where no one's going to listen to them because, after all, they announced they're leaving. But this would be like my announcing I'm going to leave my job in three years. Three years, I decide I don't feel like leaving my job, then. Uh, but I'll tell you, it will reduce my influence in the faculty <laughs> if I make that kind of statement. So for Trump, while he claimed this was a restoration of sovereignty, nothing could have gone further than to make the United States a lame duck. Uh, meanwhile, the subnationals can play a role. California alone has stepped up and can do 5% of the United States commitments. Subnational emissions trading is possible. China and India are continuing to play very aggressive roles. And most important is that the coal jobs do not exist. And by the way, the zone where uh, the election was almost uh, won by the Democrat last night is in hanging the balance as part of the coal country. Um, so it may well be that Trump will decide that this is not a good bet for him. It's not going to help him get reelected. He's done something that some people think is meaningful. The change is more rhetorical than real. You see my message. What about the Iran nuclear deal? Same thing. Engage, translate, and leverage. Lift collective sanctions, IAEA inspections to achieve an outcome that would have been unachievable by military force. It led to uh, an impressive set of outcomes, uh, increasing the amount of time for Iran to acquire a bomb, reducing stockpiles of enriched uranium, 
reducing the number of centrifuges, but most of all, um, tracking uh, their activities with an expanded uh, uh, transparency. But Trump calls it the worst deal ever. They've now certified three times it's working. Um, the IAEA cert uh, certified eight times that it's working. Trump may want to withdraw and renegotiate. You can't renegotiate by yourself. The other parties have no interest in renegotiating. Uh, the Israelis, many of them, who Barack most recently, the most uh, high profile, said um, uh, it's better than uh, a bomb. Key Republicans are uninterested. Uh, the Secretary of Defense testified he wants to preserve the deal. Congress probably wouldn't support withdrawal. And now many admit, I mean, they, they mentioned yesterday one reason Tillerson was fired was he didn't favor Trump's approach. Okay, let's see if Pompeo takes a really a different position at the end of the day. What about uh, North Korea? Um, this is a country, was well, the country of my origin. I visited North Korea uh, three times. I spent uh, four days there with uh, Secretary Albright in the year 2000. Um, it's a country where our policy in the United States has uh, changed almost every day. And not for the good, although at least now we're talking about diplomacy. Mike Pence started by saying the era of strategic patience is over. What does that mean? We're in a period of strategic impatience? But everybody agrees there is no nuclear option, or no military option in, in, in Korea. I have family members living in Seoul. Thousands, if not millions, would be killed in the first hour. Trump started by saying he wanted to recognize Taiwan. The Chinese uh, read him the Riot Act, and now he has towed the line with regard to China on these issues. Uh, the United States um, <coughs> was initially hostile to negotiations. The South Korean government of Moon Jae-in said they wanted to have these kinds of conversations. They invited the North Koreans to the Pyeongchang Olympics, a very moving sight. We had the awkward picture of Pence sitting next to Kim Jong-un's uh, sister and uh, not talking to her. Uh, Trump said to Tillerson, good luck, Rex, if you want to have these direct conversations. And now they're going to have these direct conversations if they can set it up. And Tillerson has been fired for recommending exactly what Trump is doing. Now, everybody has a lot of suspicion. Is Trump being played? Joe Yoon, our leading uh, North Korean specialist, has left the State Department. There is no ambassador. Um, but at the end of the day, despite the um, big talk of fire and fury, the main alternative is smart power, containment, sanctions, deterrence, accelerating our cyber sabotage program, um, enhanced uh, diplomacy with China, uh, using the South Koreans as a good cop. So essentially, the policy that we're back to is strategic patience, plus diplomacy, perhaps leading to another set of six-party talks. So <coughs> um, a lot of energy has been expended on this to basically run around the block. How about the Russian hack. Here's Putin um, um, <coughs> about to be reelected with a very large majority. Our House Intelligence Committee has finished its work with the um, embarrassing uh, results because of the leadership of Devin Nunes. But the Senate uh, investigation is moving forward on the issue of collusion. It's a bipartisan investigation. If you have any doubt that James Comey uh, made gigantic errors. He chose in 2016, uh, when he knew about the Russian hacking, to emphasize instead Hillary Clinton's emails. Um, but he did not make a, a public statement about that. It's an absolutely astonishing uh, breach of professional responsibility. But what about the underlying international law issue? Clearly, Russia violated U.S. sovereignty. Um, and where was the pushback? There were 17 intelligence agencies pointed this out. Obama started by expelling diplomats. Trump at first said he would lift this response. He hasn't done so. Meanwhile, the special counsel is hard at work. Uh, there are many, many lines running at this moment, obstruction of justice, money laundering, campaign finance, uh, 
business crimes. Uh, Congress has passed a sweeping <coughs> sanctions bill against Russia. The president signed it, but has slow walked the implementation. Meanwhile, Mueller keeps indicting people. A question is, should we be doing more? Admiral Stavridis, who you know from NATO, uh, argues that Russia could do this again um, as soon as the next congressional election, that it, it could be done with regard to Democrats as well as Republicans like Marco Rubio. The U.S. ought to be looking to various kinds of cyber responses, such as knocking Russian hackers offline, obstructing their hardware. And then we have the new issue just raised by Theresa May with regard to nerve agents, assassinations, etc. The real question is, will the alliance rejoin to push back? Uh, Tillerson said they would, and that was the basis for his being, one of the many bases for his being fired. What about Ukraine? Uh, I'm one of the lawyers for Ukraine. Uh, they were very close with the Obama administration. Just before the, uh, or just after Trump was elected, they decided to file their own case at the International Court of Justice in The Hague um, on two treaties, the Terrorism Financing Convention and the Convention for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination with regard to cultural erasure uh, of Crimean Tatar culture and Eastern Ukrainian um, uh, ethnicity in uh, the Crimean area. The court, by a vote of 13 to 3, uh, said that, and by a remarkable vote of 16 to 0, ruled against Russia, and mentioned that the party should work for full implementation of the Minsk package, thus making negotiations in a multilateral framework part of an international law obligation. And we are moving on to the next phase. Meanwhile, we filed uh, action at the Law of the Sea Tribunal in uh, Hamburg uh, on the theft of uh, hydrocarbons and uh, living resources in Crimea. These will all be moving to the next stage of international adjudication. It will be the biggest case since the South China Sea case. And it's another, another effort by a participant, Ukraine, to use transnational legal process to directly affect Russian conduct. Finally, the issues of war and peace. Uh, where Obama tried to leave things was that the to narrow the idea of the counterterrorism fight, to say that there is no perpetual global war on terror, but that drones can be part of a smart power approach to dismantle specific terrorist networks that have attacked the United States, like Al Qaeda. Uh, he made it clear that drones are a tool, not a strategy. The basic strategy is engage, translate, and leverage. Uh, but to use uh, drones as part of a integrated lawful targeting process. And so if you were to summarize Obama's position, it would be integrating targeting and detention, lawful targeting, lawful detention, lawful conditions of detention, and most important, cooperation with states who are also at war and rely on the same kinds of authorities. Now, I've often been asked as a human rights lawyer, how can you say all torture is illegal and then defend the use of drones under certain circumstances? The answer is, all torture is illegal at all times. And you may not like war, but as we know here in Geneva, in uh, armed conflict, some killing is lawful and some is not. So if you are a government lawyer, it's your inescapable duty to draw those lines between lawful and unlawful killing. And the next time I hear an American politician say, get the lawyers off the backs of the generals, the short answer is, don't you dare. It is the lawyers who are helping to determine whether what's going on is lawful use of force and armed conflict or murder. Now, what we don't know is whether Trump is following Obama's rules. It's classified. It's a little unclear. Um, there's a lot of uh, circumstantial evidence that people could discuss. But I think we need to be beware of what I would call the self-generated 9-11. What I think this is building up to is this. As you know, ISIS said, come or kill. Many in Europe uh, and also in the United States have started to launch attacks by driving trucks down the street as in Nice or by um, uh, Charlie Hebdo or uh, the, uh, uh, the um, attack on the nightclub in 
Paris. Uh, in the United States, we had the attack on the Pulse nightclub. Uh, we also had attacks in uh, Las Vegas. But these are not by members of ISIS. Even if, as they go out the door, they post on Facebook a positive statement. These are homegrown, self-radicalized individuals. And <laughs> enraging a homegrown attacker is not the same as 9-11. Uh, and it doesn't warrant sending someone to a military commission. And what Trump, I think, is gearing up to with his devaluation of the courts and his claim that everyone is a member of a terrorist group is at an appropriate moment to say that the courts cannot protect us from bad hombres and then say that those people should go to military law before a military commission and reopen Guantanamo. That's essentially why he called for the reopening of Guantanamo in his State of the Union message. The <laughs> um, bellwether on this will be the travel ban case, which will help to determine uh, the real test of whether the court will defer. And on many of these issues, there is a connection between what happens in one area and another. The strongest force backing maintenance of the Iran nuclear deal is North Korea. Because after all, how can diplomacy succeed in North Korea if the United States will not stick by di nuclear diplomacy in Iran? Finally, let me uh, return to the most difficult issue. In ISIS, uh, the allies now hold strongholds in Iraq and Syria. Um, this is essentially the hard power pieces of Hillary Clinton's plan. So the Trump plan is Hillary Clinton minus soft power. And we now have a whole new set of dilemmas. Uh, what will happen with the Turks? What will happen with the Kurds? How long will troops stay? Uh, multiple units are in Syria from many different countries. Uh, will we work together to dismantle the global networks, the money networks, um, to discredit the ideology online, to harden defenses, and most of all, to maintain strong alliances? While, meanwhile, Assad stays on as in, in the middle of slaughtering uh, the citizens of eastern Ghouta. This is where we stand in what uh, Secretary General Guterres called hell on earth. 500,000 dead, 7 million displaced, 3 million refugees, 2 million children. A question is whether my uh, late colleague Dick Holbrook's approach, diplomacy backed by force, is available to achieve ceasefire and a power-sharing accord, a Syrian Dayton like Lebanon, where you could protect refugees and try to work for accountability against Assad over the longer term. Interestingly, Trump agreed with Clinton, Pence, and Kane, the other three national candidates, that it was possible or should, more should be done. But after a one-time chemical weapons response in last April, um, the United States has exhibited no Syrian strategy whatsoever, and in particular, no um, diplomatic approach. The question is, can the Trump administration do what needs to be done? Work on root causes, negotiate a lasting ceasefire, uh, consider creating a humanitarian corridor, work with UNHCR on the various refugee issues, get the funding from frozen Syrian assets, and pursue accountability against Assad in some forum, perhaps a Jordanian forum. You could see a Hillary Clinton presidency doing this. Uh, the Trump presidency has no Secretary of State and will probably not have one for a little while longer. All of this illustrates um, the loneliness of Europe. The German foreign minister said, um, international law is under challenge. There's a longing for order, clarity, and hierarchy. But there's a rise of authoritarianism in such countries as China, where she has just been extended as president for a third term, perhaps for life. Poland, Hungary, Italy, Venezuela, Philippines. I can go around the world. The irony, Trump talks about uh, governing through chaos, when in fact, uh, what is being promoted here is a set of authoritarian values. What's at stake is this. We have lived under a world of Kantian global governance, the model sketched out in his famous pamphlet toward perpetual peace. International society 
governed by law among free states collectively explicating shared moral commitments. And what is looming instead is a kind of authoritarian spheres of influence world that we saw under Orwell's 1984. This is what could be looming uh, as this battle continues. So will Donald Trump international law? Will he change the process or will it change him? Will his coalition shatter before it coalesces? After all, he is running a coalition <coughs> government no less than Theresa May is. Uh, traditional Republicans are turning against him. And most important, they are saying, where are the things that we elected you for? They got one thing, the tax reform. They didn't get uh, repeal of health care. And now we're turning to the November by-election. It's entirely possible that if there's a shattering loss that Trump will be challenged in the primary uh, and will not be the candidate in 2020. Meanwhile, as the singer says, breaking up is hard to do. It turns out it's not so easy to exit from these regimes. Um, Americans actually want what these regimes provide, clean energy, a nuclear weapon-free Iran. Trump doesn't really care about leaving these, and so our default has become resigning without leaving. And the real question is, will these regimes endure? But the rope dope has its costs. As you see, um, Muhammad Ali took an extreme beating, and we're taking a beating. Uh, it's a struggle. Uh, all of our alliances are strained, everyone is exhausted, and we see Russia and China filling the leadership vacuum. And meanwhile, the rest of the world is moving on. Take trade. The United States left the TPP. It's going on without it. 35 trade pacts are under consideration. The United States is just in one of them. Meanwhile, Trump is threatening to renegotiate agreements with people who have no interest in negotiating them. He's threatening a tariff war. As an economist for George Bush said, the United States thought the world would stop but, and the process would come to an end. It just moves on without us. Which leads me to my final point. Uh, there's a famous joke told by Mel Brooks, the American comedian, about the 2,000-year-old man. He said, uh, I've been alive for 2,000 years, and he's asked, before God, was there someone else? And he said, yeah, there was a guy named Phil. And what happened? He said, we would say to Phil, oh, Phil, don't beat us and don't kick us and don't hurt us. And then one day, lightning came out of the sky and struck Phil dead. And we said, there's something bigger than Phil. <laughs> well, there's something bigger than Trump. It's transnational legal process. I've just given you a quick overview, but it's working. It's stopping him. It's impeding him. One of my students came to me and said, I love America. I hate Trump. Can the U.S. win if Trump loses? And I said, yes, Trump doesn't own this process. He's only one player in it. We all own it. So <laughs> there is a course, a counter strategy, that can be and is being applied to preserve the world we've inherited. We just have to fight for it together. So my message to all of you here in Geneva is uh, America can get by. Uh, but as uh, uh, all of our favorite, the Beatles said, uh, we need a little help from our friends. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor, for this excellent um, talk, for these excellent uh, reflections. I have uh, several questions uh, coming to my mind, but Taking your message seriously, I'll try not to be the bully in the room, uh, limit myself to two questions, but packed into one, so it's shorter, uh, before giving you guys uh, um, uh, the word, because I see there, there are already people uh, really uh, moving on their seats, so, so I, I guess they're ready to jump up with, with some questions. Well, the first one, you, you touch upon both elements. The first one is, um, could we actually, well, if, if you take a step backwards, having a little bit more distance to you in foreign policy, um, you could argue that, well, actually, we know that it's a, bi it's a partisan affair. You have the Democrats more engagement, the Republicans more disengagement. So ba basically, it's a back and f back, always switching back and forth. And maybe now with the Trump administration, well, it's like 2003 when America invaded Iraq, but it's maybe just a little bit worse. But is there really something new to the story? And, and, and there, the question would be, well, actually, is, 
it much more dramatic than what we're seeing or, or thinking in the sense that what we just saw with the, with the House of um, Intelligence Committee, that there is a breakdown of a consensus among, about uh, certain values, certain issues about the, the value of international law among both parties. Or if you take it at the international level, uh, thinking of international Geneva, even among major powers, if you, if you look at how states, the behave in the debacle of debacle of, uh, of Syria, well, maybe the time of liberal institutionalism is, 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 is past and the norms, maybe they're not as sticky as such. And we are at a turning point in the sense that um, there are new rules to the game, which is, which is real politic. And the second one, you mentioned, um, well, it's the second question, but let's pretend it's the second part of the question. Uh, the rope of the dope tactic, which sounds really good. And you, you, you mentioned that Muhammad Ali really took some hard hits. And coming from small states, I, 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 I can tell that taking hard hits is, is, is hard. So, 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 so since we're in international Geneva and many small states are represented, uh, um, now focusing less on the transnational process, but more on the international process. And you said you need help from your friends. How would you go about that? Are there any, and there any insights, any recommendations of how to use the global governance structure to get through this let's say, hard times, hopefully temporary times. Thank you. Yes. Um, let me take the second part first. I'd say to these small countries, uh, keep, keep calm and carry on. Um, the fact of the matter is that uh, don't, don't overreact to things which do not have legal meaning. Uh, I think the response to the Paris is a good example of people just misunderstanding what Trump actually did. He, the people who opposed him were not his bureaucracy. There were political people in his own government, including his own daughter and son-in-law. And at the very last minute, they decided to say they would withdraw. To say they would withdraw means in November 2019, they intend to announce their withdrawal. If you look at the State Department website, it says in November 2019, we will consider withdrawing, depending on the conditions at the time. You don't have to be an international lawyer to know this is a meaningless statement. Um, and I think it was partly drafted because Tillerson was one of the people who opposed the withdrawing. On November 2019, the United States may send in a letter, or it may not. As soon as they send in a letter, they will be sued. And then the question will be, can the president withdraw from a treaty without the consent of Congress? Uh, I think it's, a, uh, it's an issue that was litigated once before, never got to the substance. My own guess is um, the litigation will take more than a year. If somebody else was elected president on November 4th, 2020, the whole episode ends with a big nothing. Now, and by the way, Trump has said, or his people have said, we're going to continue to attend the Paris meetings. Um, and, and we're going to speak against many of the initiatives. To which the answer is, okay, fine. Uh, then, you know, I, I, I was part of the process to try to bring the US back into the ICC. It's a similar kind of thing. Is this good? No. <laughs> is this the way things should be done? No. But is it curable? Yes. So I would say, you know, keep your eyes on the prize. On the first uh, part of your question, Tobias, What's new here? Um, well, first of all, you know, for many years, the claim was that the Republicans were better at foreign policy and national security. Uh, I don't think that has proven to be true. Uh, the, their focus is almost entirely on hard power. Trump simultaneously insults generals and puts generals in charge of virtually all aspects of his foreign policy. Um, but there is no thoughtful strategy for dealing with these complex problems. You know, look at the Syria problem. Is that a soluble problem? It ought to be, but it requires collective leadership. Uh, why are people worried about a negotiation with Kim Jong-un? Because we have people who worked on this for years and they're not in the government anymore. And it sounds like, you know, Trump just grab this. He doesn't have a team to do anything about it. Uh, when you cannot tell whether it's the president of Korea, North Korea, or the president of the United States who's talking about fire and fury, <laughs> we have a problem. 
Um, so creating the diplomatic apparatus with uh, 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 smart and uh, important allies. You see it on the Iran nuclear process. The, the, the P5 plus one process in the Iran nuclear deal is holding because the allies are saying, we're not gonna renegotiate. And by the way, Trump has no leverage on them and that we have no leverage on Iran anymore. That moment came when they struck the deal. That's why nobody wants to leave the deal. So what's new? Two things are new. One, George B. W. Bush had a united party behind him. He had won majorities in both houses. Trump is running a coalition government. There's 30% of Americans are these people he goes and talks to who wear red hats and talk about guns and things like that. Um, you know, they're not foreign policy experts. Um, and then there are the traditional Republicans who have shown that they have absolutely no commitment to any set of values. I mean, it's remarkable. They have absolutely no commitment to any set of values. It turned out they claimed to care about budget restraint, and they didn't. They care about uh, not violating, uh, not defaulting. They didn't do that. They supposedly cared about ma moral values, and they're supporting you know, people who are accused of um, uh, uh, sexual misconduct. Um, and, you know, what finally got them mad is when Trump imposed steel tariffs. <laughs> this, is amazing, this is quite an amazing thing. That was, that was the breaking point, steel tariffs. Now, um, that is an incredibly fragile group. And if you just break the coalition, then Trump has 30% who will vote for him no matter what. And then there are a group of people who will vote for Mitt Romney or, or somebody else. Um, and I, I, if Trump is indicted or the people around him are indicted, look at the tally. Trump got Gorsuch, um, Trump got a tax cut. We have 50 executive orders, no outcome. We have 32 members of the government resigned or fired in the last year. That's a, an astonishing number, almost one a day in the last couple of weeks. We have no executive order on torture. We have no executive order on black sites. We have no executive order on withdrawing from international agreements. We're still in Paris. We're still in Iran. Travel ban uh, is still being blocked. President's uh, uh, rating is at an all-time low. Um, that doesn't look like winning to me. The rope of dope is working. Now, is it, is it paying a price? Yes. If Trump wins back the House in November, does it make it harder? Yes. Um, if Trump is reelected in 2020, does that make it harder? Yes. Why? Because then the career, career bureaucracy will probably leave. You know, they don't really want to work for Trump. Um, but, uh, so this is a strategy for, for the, the immediate term. But I don't know how many times I've been asked, you know, people who are watching these day-to-day -day events are saying to me, we're losing, we're losing. And the answer is, we're not losing. I mean, again, separate the signal from the noise. And remember, there is a counter strategy, but the counter strategy requires people to work together in opposition. The greatest advantage the government has is it's organized. It has a hierarchy. And uh, the other forces are disaggregated. So they have to develop these kinds of coalitions. You see it in the Paris climate uh, discussions is there is the group of people who uh, want to stay in. And they're working with Americans like we're still in. You know, Michael Bloomberg was just named UN Special Envoy for climate change. And he's a very effective player, much more effective than Trump much richer than Trump. <laughs> so there are these kinds of um, shadow mechanisms being created across the board to protect the real US interests in these. And allies and even small countries can work closely with these shadow interests, keeping a long-term picture in mind. And you know, don't get distracted by the latest bright, shiny object.
Thank you very much. Very interesting and also very concrete. So I would like to open the floor. Um, if I could just ask you to present yourself. The mic is going around. Yes, sir. Daniel Warner, a non-lawyer. Uh, two legal questions, Harold. First, it still remains in the long term that in the United States, constitutional American law is higher than international law, and that can't be changed. And the second thing is one of the legacies of the Obama administration are, is a number of federal judgeships which are now being filled, which could last for a long time as an influence. It's not just the Supreme Court. Well, the second point is, is very important. Um, both points are important, but the second one is more immediate. Trump has essentially turned over the judgeships to a group called the Federalist Society, and they are plowing away getting people appointed, including very young people with close to no professional background, and just ramming them through. Now, this, you know, it used to be that you had to get 60 votes to get past a filibuster, and then they changed the rules. Now you only need, um, uh, you only need 51, and the Republicans have 51. That's why they supported um, uh, uh, Luther Strange and then um, uh, the other guy in, in uh, 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 Georgia, the, uh, uh, Roy Moore. They wanted to get the judges. Now there's a suggestion that Anthony Kennedy, who is the swing justice, might retire. And that will be a huge issue because after all, they blocked Merrick Garland uh, which was really a shameful uh, display. I was told that on the morning of the election, that morning, Mitch McConnell convened a group of people to discuss how to get Garland confirmed, because he thought that Hillary was going to win. So they w wanted to have Garland rather than a younger, more left person. So I agree, that's, that's the source of major concern. What is happening, though, is that even judges who were appointed by Republicans are ruling against Trump. You know, Judge Robart, the so-called judge, is a Republican. And um, he's, he's been ruling against, uh, you know. So the question is, can the confirmation process ensure a certain level of, of professionalism and competence? Now, on international law being subject to constitutional law, we do have a set of cases in which international law is part of the interpretation of uh, constitutional law. Um, the exact same rule applies. Um, due process is, is not an American concept or equality, you know, egalite, fraternite. Um, as a result, uh, international human rights law is helping to inform the interpretation of this. Uh, there's a good example of this. The United States fr prohibits, as a matter of constitutional law, cruel and unusual punishments. And it turned out that the United States continued to claim the right to execute minors and also people with mental disabilities. But then it turned out it's the only country in the world doing it. That's unusual. And our Constitution forbids cruel and unusual punishments. And so the Supreme Court moved and invalidated it. Uh, or the same goes for LGBT rights. Uh, there's an amazing capacity of European precedents to, to influence how people do things. In, in the uh, Lawrence versus Texas, the sodomy case, the first citations to European Court of Human Rights rulings. Or I'll give you another example. Um, we're here for a NATO meeting, which is off the record, but I attended a NATO meeting some years ago when they were considering whether to get, eliminate the um, um, ban on gays in the military. And so we convened a lunch, and some of my uh, skeptical colleagues were there, and I asked all of the European legal advisors for the military institutions to talk about when they eliminated the ban on gays in the military. The first guy started by saying, well, in Germany, we eliminated 1969. Now, many people express concerns about interoperability. It was a subject we we're going to talk about more. They said, didn't you find that this uh, diminished the uh, unit cohesion? At which point the German legal advisor said, well, in, in NATO forces, American soldiers have been serving alongside gay Germans since 1969. <laughs> have you noticed any diminution in their, uh, in their coherence or their, their unit cohesion? 
and uh, he had no idea. It turned out that these are myths that were being put forward and not tested in countries where, in fact, we had gay soldiers serving. You could actually test these myths, prove they were false, and then put that evidence to a U.S. court. Um, and it ended up not having to go to a U.S. court at the end of the day. It ended up being resolved by the Obama administration. So, by the way, uh, here's another example. Trump came in and said he wanted to um, uh, eliminate transgender individuals in the military. It turned out that General Mattis had already implemented a process where they, uh, they could stay in. Um, and it turns out, again, that U.S. soldiers have been serving alongside transgender individuals in NATO units for years. And so, again, uh, now it's on pause. Um, so if you don't follow the news cycle, you hear the first bad thing that Trump has done, whatever he tweeted this morning, and then people react in horror. <coughs> the real question is, at the end of the day, did it, did it change things? And most important, you should ask, did it gain him any votes at his next election? Because if it didn't, he doesn't really care about it. Yes, uh, Professor Lau, oh, I would like to know about how far is the power of the Congress uh, for the counter strategy in the United States, and secondly, how far is also uh, uh, the, the division of the, of the world by the trade war and so on. So uh, that's one question I, I want to, to know from you. Thank you. Well, Congress has never been more divided, and it votes entirely now on partisan lines. Um, you know, I, I honestly believe that um, if we move much further along with the imposition of tariffs, you know, mo most of these Republican congressmen were trained or raised on the notion that the Smoot-Hawley tariff of two 1930 started the worldwide depression. And they're not interested in voting for tariffs or protectionism. They're, they're free traders. So I don't think that the steel tariff war threat will go very far down the line. And under US constitutional law, it's Congress that has the power over foreign commerce, and therefore the power to set tariff schedules. Notice that what Trump is doing instead is he's implementing many of these trade restrictions as national security measures. For example, Section 232, th Section 301, are things he can do under executive authority. But the core issue of steel tariffs will have to be done under Congress's power, and my guess is they won't vote for or carry through that, uh, that element of it. As you may have noticed, most of the Republican members of Congress who are in contested seats are quitting. They're gonna be defeated. And so it was originally thought, you know, the, the Democrats need to win 24 seats to regain the House. Most people think they'll win 30 seats. The Senate is a little bit trickier, um, and the Senate obviously is where you confirm judges. Uh, it's also where you make treaties, if you ever make a treaty. <laughs> but um, um, so that's a more complicated picture. But I, I was recently with Hillary Clinton. This is a very important point who, by the way, is doing fine. Um, and to sit with her is a, a, a horrifying experience because the most qualified candidate in American history was defeated by the worst qualified candidate in American history. And to listen to her is an astonishing example of this. But one of the people in the audience got up and said, who should be running for president in 2020? And, and Hillary Clinton said, don't think at all about 2020. It's all about November 2018. Um, if the Democrats win back the House, all kinds of things are possible and the entire political landscape will change. If they don't, that means, well, you all saw it when Bush won re-election. Um, there'll be a cascade effect. And she said, so to be obsessed at this point, as many outsiders are with 2020, is a big mistake. November 2018 is, you know, that's eight months away.
It's okay? Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor. It was very interesting and inspiring to learn all facts that you actually shared with us. Uh, my name is Dragan Filipovic. I'm ambassador of the Council of Europe. But I spent some time in the United States, so I'm very much interested to ask you uh, something, and I have basically two points. First, um, is it fair to say, based on what you told us, that basically United States administration actually disrespect and violates international law. And the second uh, uh, point is uh, related uh, to unpredictability of US foreign policy. And uh, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, right after elections, we had the situation where the first cabinet of President Trump was full of combat generals, not any generals, but combat generals, quite a number of them, uh, which tells me that, uh, you know, that he uh, definitely had certain support by some military establishment in order to get to the power. Uh, now, as you said, you need allies still. And the situation uh, in Euro-Atlantic relations, your traditional allies, of course, they are still there, but there is a new quality of that kind of, uh, I would say, cooperation, a new reality, because Europe is also uh, these days uh, experiencing new reality. And the last point, I would like to learn your uh, view. Uh, you spoke about North Korea, about Iran, uh, as a very important uh, crisis, Syria, of course. Uh, uh, don't you think that despite of all, all odds, whatever, that uh, you need to cooperate with Russia and China on those issues, either through diplomatic uh, uh, communication or in other ways? Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Um, if there's a message of my remarks, the United States is much bigger than Trump. Does Trump respect international law? No. But he has a very big government, and most of the people there, they've all taken an oath. I, I took the oath many times. You do not take an oath to serve the president. You take an oath to uphold the Constitution and laws of the United States of America, and that includes treaties to which the United States is a party. Some of those treaties are the Geneva Conventions. You know, military generals follow the Geneva Conventions. And they meet regularly with their counterparts to discuss military interoperability. And they will get no cooperation if they don't agree to cooperate on the Geneva Conventions. So it is this desire for alliance politics that is the bulwark against Trump's, you know, and, and remember, Trump does not have enough um, consistency or attention span to push initiatives through. He just simply wants to check a box and move on. So a good example, could Trump have just walked out of the Paris Agreement? Yes. <laughs> if he wanted to break international law, he could have. Instead, he's scrupulously obeying the notification provision. <laughs> you know, because his supporters believe that he's leaving. All he's done is say, I'm, I'm, I will be leaving. And, and you know, if they buy that, that's enough for him. That's all he has to do. It's good enough for him to make a speech at a rally. Now, do we have to cooperate with Russia and China? Well, obviously, there are things that we cannot solve. You know, Syria, um, you know, uh, the Iran nuclear deal, et cetera. But, you know, we are in the middle of a major, uh, I mean, uh, Putin is emboldened in a way, you know, you know, they just assassinated two people in Salisbury, England, using nerve agents that they were spreading around to pubs and pizza joints and hundreds of, uh, hundreds of thousands of people are, are, are being affected by this. This, this is a level of, of aggressiveness and, and brazenness that we haven't seen. And it turns out that this tinkering with the election, which you know, was an astonishing outcome, started well before anybody I imagined. And it's all gearing back now to the extent of the relationship between Trump and the uh, Russians for finances and other kinds of things. That's clearly the subject of the... Um, so I'm fine with, you know, the United States and cooperated with Russia and China in many settings, but 
they never kidded themselves that they have identical interests. And they never kidded themselves that either of these is a rule of law or human rights respecting nation. I mean, you can have common non-zero sum objectives, but that's not the same as being in um, the NATO alliance or the EU or other kinds of uh, Kantian arrangements of the kind I'm describing. We are approaching two o'clock, so our boss, this one is back at the office or at least at work. Mm -hmm. Maybe a last one, Ambassador Silviger. Thank you, Valentin Selweger. I'm the Swiss ambassador here at the United Nations. If I get your advice correctly, you say sit back, get beaten, and stand up when it's uh, over. Um, you alluded to the fight between uh, Muhammad Ali and uh, George Foreman. I think it's referred to as the rumble in the jumble. In boxing, they have quite clear a clear set of rules. So even if you get up again after eight rounds, it's clear if you have won. My question would be, does that also apply to international law? Um, if we now sit back, get beaten, stand up again, will international law in, say, say, four years or eight years still be the same, given the fact that the US have always, uh, always played an extremely important role in upholding international law on the international level? And given the fact that we have an increasing number of authoritarian rulers who do not believe in the same values uh, as we do, may not believe also in international law, and will also do their bit to change the character of international law. So will it be still the same once we get up and try to continue to work? Uh, well, it depends. Um, so uh, Valentin and I worked very closely together. He uh, um, uh, was a great colleague of mine. Um, I don't recommend that we just sit back th and be beaten. Uh, the story you just heard is not one of passivity. On the, it's, it's a story of resistance. Um, but you have to accept that in the course of that resistance, you will take some blows. You're not going to win everything. What Muhammad Ali showed is being hit is different from losing. You can be hit a lot <laughs> and still prevail. Now, you're obviously asking the question, which is the same question Tobias asked, is you take enough abuse and you start to come unglued. And this, uh, this post-war system, the United States uh, stops supporting it, uh, and then it starts to come apart. And let's not forget that this wasn't just the Trump administration, it was the George W. Bush administration did the same thing. So the rest of the world is not happy with the notion that every couple of years the United States suddenly declares war on everything it was doing and urging people to do for the previous eight years and then suddenly comes back and says, you know, we, we saw that when we came back into the International Criminal Court. Is people were saying, where, where were you at Rome? And the answer is, look, we cannot control our political system. Um, but here, I think, is the real point. Um, you know, the strength of this turns on civil society. Every government in the, every country in the world, the government is not as good as the people. I, mean, I just think about your own country. Is the government <laughs> as good as? And in dem democracies, we have robust civil societies. And the civil societies can collaborate. It turns out that what's happening on climate change is collaboration among the civil societies in a way that makes the governments far less important. The governments can make a certain kind of framework of cooperation, but it's implemented by all of these other players, businesses, subnational entities, intergovernmental organizations, private companies. If all of the businesses shift their spending to clean energy, it doesn't matter. You know, the, the law, law will reaffirm a pattern of change cooperation. So I think that's what we need to do. So um, are you saying, you know, people often say to me, oh, you're a very optimistic person. And to which my answer is no, I'm not optimistic. I just think that the forces of, uh, of uh, progress can prevail if they work together. If they give up or they think we're all is lost, or surrender the field to Donald Trump and people like Donald Trump all across Europe, 
uh, then we're in trouble. And there are very troubling signs. You know, look at Italy. Um, in every country in the world, there are these forces. And I also think it goes to solving the, the Syria situation. You know, Syria really brought on the refugee crisis, you know, has put tremendous pressure on Turkey, Jordan, has created this backlash across uh, Europe and the splintering around these issues. You know, you know Merkel is barely holding on. And that's a great, you know, uh, you know arguably caused Brexit and um, you know, contributed to the election of Trump. So I do think that a failure to do more on Syria early had catastrophic consequences. But, you know, you can't go back. You can only go forward. Um, do I wish we were not in this place? Yes. Uh, but do I think it's hopeless from where we are? No. And uh, do I think that the way forward requires this disaggregated forces to work together? You know, why would I come to Geneva other than to tell others we need a little help from our friends? <laughs> because, you know, a lot of it is to see we have common interests. In fact, American civil society right now has many more common interests with all of you than it does with its own government. Um, but if you want proof that the American civil society is not cooperating, look out into the streets and look at, in, there is no issue in which there is not active resistance and um, the, the forces of progress are s storming out. Under Obama, they could say, well, I guess we got Obama, things must be great. <laughs> you know, we're in a post-racial society. Guess what, we're not. So now we have to fight for what we have and it's, it's not as easy, but I think it's a fight worth having. Will, will we be too battered and bruised or will the world order be too battered and bruised? It depends. But this is why you, um, I was asked, is your model of transnational legal process like science? And I said, no, it's more like medicine. You know, someone says I have cancer, will I die? It depends. Uh, are you lucky? Uh, how good a doctor you have? How good is the treatment? How hard do you fight? That's the exact same situation. You know, we, the, the body politic is subject to the exact same thing. Some people survive and some people don't. And I think we've invested too much in what we have to just uh, give up. Geneva is organized around that principle that, that um, you know, I, I was walking through the city last night and again remembering how much has been built since the 1940s. It's amazing. Is it perfect? No, but it's all we got. So we have to fight for it. Thank you very much, Professor, for, for, for these thoughts, for explaining. Thank you for coming here to Geneva. If you are interested in continuing the debate or, or the reflection, um, there is an excellent symposium on Opinio Juris, so the blog. So take a look at Opinio Juris Symposium. The title is Trump Administration and International Law. If you are a little bit patient, uh, enjoy the summer. And then when the winter days are coming in, the new book from Professor Harold Coe is going to be out uh, in September, published by Oxford University Press. You know the main lines, but it's going to be very interesting to read the details more, more, more in general. And also, if you're interested in similar uh, debates, discussions uh, on similar topics, uh, please feel free to, to join the next event of the Security and Law Reality Check Series. So the next event is going to be on 2 uh, May, um, treating about, uh, talking about peace operations with the simple questions, can peace operations breach the law? So the question is very simple. The answer is a little bit less simple, and unfortunately, the consequences are much more complicated. So with that, thank you very much for coming here. Thank you very much for engaging for the discussions. Uh, thank you also, uh, Salimata, Alessandro, Ashley, uh, Marilor, all those that made this event possible, and a very, very warm and special thanks to Professor Coe. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you.